The uh, search for the origins of species, both in general and of specific kinds of creatures, has entailed a series of truly epic adventures over the last 200 years, and I had a wonderful time chronicling those in a, in a new book. What I want to do today is share with you a few of those stories and really celebrate the explorers who undertook these adventures. Now, I think author C.W. Sarum described adventure best as a mixture of spirit and deed. And what I hope is that you'll come away with some inspiration from their spirit and a much greater appreciation for the magnitude of their deeds. Now this year, throughout the world, we're celebrating the achievements of Charles Darwin, no doubt the world's greatest naturalist and the leader of a far-reaching scientific revolution. Do you want to check something here? All right. You can keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, and my talk today is in part my contribution to that party, but my agenda is a little broader than that because while Darwin's work and his voyages are well known, and rightly so, two other men made major contributions to both the birth and early acceptance of the theory of evolution. They were Alfred Wallace and Henry Walter Bates, and these two men undertook voyages even longer in duration and under more difficult circumstances than Darwin. These three men had a lot in common. They were all young Englishmen, and they were all desperate to escape gray, drab, rainy, cold England for the glories of the tropics, or at least the glories that they had read about from some previous travelers. They were also prodigious collectors. Uh, I think they had some form of OCD, sort of obsessive collecting disorder, because for virtually their entire lives, they pickled and pinned and labeled virtually every creature that they came across. They were also young men. Very important to keep in mind that their critical voyages were taken at the age, in Darwin's case, of 22. Bates was 23. Wallace was 25 when he left home. But it was through this prodigious collecting that each individual gathered a great appreciation for the variety that each species exhibited. And from this really hard-earned knowledge, they evolved from mere collectors into scientists who asked not just what creatures existed, but how those creatures came to be. And the pursuit of that question led each man to unique discoveries. So what I want to do in the course of my talk is have us walk in the footsteps of these three pioneers and to understand how the creatures they encountered inspired these ideas. And I think that the voyages and discoveries of these three men, they really constitute a golden age, not just in evolutionary science, but in, certainly in all of biology, if not exploration in general. And in the second part of my talk, I briefly want to explain why I think right now, today, we're in a second golden age of evolutionary science. Now, no one's experiences better fit that description of spirit and deed than Alfred Wallace. So my tales today will begin with Alfred Wallace in the Amazon. Now, Wallace proposed to his friend and fellow collector, Henry Walter Bates, that they go to the Amazon and they really had a simple initial motivation, which was to collect. They had exhausted what England had to offer. They thought, wouldn't it be great to go to the tropics, collect all these beautiful and exotic things for our own collections? Only there were a couple of problems. They were broke. They had no way to do all this unless they figured out some way to earn a living while collecting. So they hatched a scheme that they would collect lots of duplicates, lots of extra specimens that they would then ship back to England and have an agent sell them to other collectors or to museums. And they secured an agent, so they took care of that. They were very eager to go to the tropics for other reasons. They hated their day jobs. They had both finished school at age 13 and worked through a series of jobs, so they weren't going to leave any great career behind. So that was all okay. But Wallace was very well read on the science of the times. 
And one of the major issues in discussion in the mid-1840s in England was the question of the origin of species. So Wallace said to Bates, let's go gather facts towards solving the problem of the origin of species. What was that problem? Well, in the 1840s, the question was, were species specially created by God and placed on the earth to occupy some particular region for some appointed time? Or were species the product of natural laws, changeable, fitting in to wherever they may find themselves on the surface of the earth? So off Wallace and Bates went. They found a ship to take them to the coast of Brazil, and they landed on the coast of Brazil in 1848. And for about a year, they explored this region around Para, shown here in the star. And after that, well, they said they split up to cover more territory, which I think was the gentleman's way of saying they were getting on each other's nerves, living in the same tent. So we're going to catch up with, with uh, Henry Walter Bates a little bit later, but we're going to follow Wallace's journey. And he made his way over the succeeding three years up the Amazon, up the Rio Negro, up tributary, tributaries of the Rio Negro, such that by 1852, he was 2,000 miles upriver, further than any European had ever gone. And he had had it. He was exhausted. He, in addition to just the physical exertion of collecting all this time, you know, travel was really difficult. Food was often scarce. There were hostile tribes, dangerous animals, innumerable encounters with tropical diseases. Um, and he was laid up for several months far upriver with either yellow fever or malaria or both. And in addition to all these maladies, he had, well, he had a, a brilliant, what he thought, inspiration that in order to really bring the Amazon back to England, he wanted to bring live animals all the way home to the London Zoo. So he was keeping 30 or so animals and, in small cages and feeding them every day. And of course, their upkeep was just wiping them out. So he figured, I've got to go home, I've got to turn back, or I'm probably going to die in the jungle. So he gathered up his animals, which included a, a woolly monkey and a macaw and a toucan, and he made his way 2,000 miles downriver back to the port of Para. Along the way, he picked up various crates of specimens that he hadn't had time to ship home to England yet, found a ship that was headed back to England, the Helen, kind of a rickety old brig, but nonetheless, it was headed in the right direction, loaded his animals, loaded up his specimens, and set sail for England. And, you know, he starts thinking of, well, maybe a warm bed at night and you know, bread and butter and other little luxuries that, of course, he had been doing without for four years in the jungle. Well, what, well, what happens next? I'm going to let Wallace tell you. He was about 700 miles east of Bermuda and still really recovering from his last sick sickness when the captain came to his cabin and said, I'm afraid the ship's on fire. Come and see what you think of it. So Wallace, still sort of in a fog, gets up out of his cabin and follows the captain to the hold. And sure enough, the hold is smoldering, and Wallace realizes it can go up in flames at any second. There's not much time. So he races back to his cabin. All he has time to do is to just grab a small tin box and throw in a few shirts and some drawings he made of some Amazonian fish. And he makes his way to the lifelines and starts working his way down the rope, box in one hand, slips, sears his hands on the rope, hits the salt water, that had to feel great, paddles over to the lifeboat, climbs in and realizes it's leaking, and starts bailing water. And then he turns around as that lifeboat is bobbing in the open Atlantic, and he sees the Helen fully engulfed. And he, of course, realizes that his collections were in the hold, and all the reward of his four years of privation and danger 
or lost. The Helen burns and sinks in front of his eyes with all of his specimens. Now, he can't dwell too long on what he's lost. He's in the open Atlantic in 1852, right? Survival is the issue. For Wallace, day after day, we continued in the boats. We were scorched by the sun, my hands, nose, and ears being completely skinned and drenched every day by the season spray. We were constantly wet and had no comfort at night. We had a short allowance of water, which left us constantly thirsty. Now, you might think day after day in this lifeboat, at some point he might have had a moment to reflect and say, how did I get in this predicament? Well, you know, beyond blaming himself, if he was to blame anyone else for being in that lifeboat after that long trip through the Amazon, well, it would be this fellow. Charles Darwin. And the reason is that Darwin already knew the answer to the question of the origin of species that had inspired Wallace to go to the Amazon. In fact, Darwin knew from a voyage he had taken 15 years earlier. Here's the first published account of that voyage. Wallace had no idea that this earlier naturalist was sitting at home in the village of Down with a magnificent theory of the origin of species that he just hadn't told anyone. So how do we know Darwin knew? And what did he know? Let's take a, just a few minutes to revisit some key stops on Darwin's own voyage. Remind you a few of the highlights. It started in 1831, just after Christmas. He was 22 years old. Sorry. 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 Sure. I'm sorry to bother you. You have such a handsome beard. I'm just hearing that on the audio. All right. There you go. For that. There we go. You were hearing an animal in the beard, I think, actually. That's the, yeah. That's the right story. So, started just after Christmas in 1831. 22-year-old Charles Darwin boards the Beagle and heads off on what he thinks is going to be a two-year voyage. So one of the first key stops is on the coast of Argentina, near the area of Bahia Blanca in 1833. Now, Darwin, in his last few months in Cambridge, got some training in geology, vital training. He, in fact, thought of himself, really, as a geologist. And so he was collecting all sorts of rocks and minerals, and if he could find them, fossils. And he sees some fossils eroding out of the coast of Argentina. And so he extracts them, crates them up, sends them back to England. He doesn't know what they are. He's going to rely on the experts in England to identify them. And he finds some things like skulls, jaws, molars, vertebrae. And he finds out many months later that what he found were the remnants of seven different species. But what was remarkable about these animals was they were all huge, so-called South American megafauna. So, for example, this giant ground sloth right over my head here would tower over me in real life, enormous fossil skeleton. And this thing, Toxodon, was like a giant armadillo, much larger than the living animals of South America that he was seeing every day. Now, it didn't quite sink into him yet, but it started to plant the seed of him thinking about the geological relationship between these extinct animals that he saw eroding out of the ground and the living animals that were walking around South America. Now, as I said, this was already into 1833. He was in the second year of the voyage, and they hadn't gone very far yet. And Darwin realized this is not going to be a two-year voyage. Now, you may know that he never overcame his seasickness. So every day on that beagle was a test. He wrote home, in fact, I, I know not how I will endure it. So how did Darwin endure? How did he last through this voyage? And it was really a matter that he didn't know what was around the next corner, what was going to be seen in the next bay or his next adventure inland. Often when the beagle docked somewhere, he would hire some horses and some local experts and ride off to explore the inlands of South America. And he didn't want to give up that opportunity, so he stuck with it despite some harrowing experiences at sea, including nearly capsizing the beagle three times. So he kept going, stuck with it, and by 1835, 
The Beagle made its way up the west side, west coast of South America, turned away from the mainland continent and towards the Galapagos Islands. Now, we all know about the Galapagos Islands and Darwin, but what you need to appreciate is that Darwin, he wasn't thinking about the creatures as the Beagle turned, turned towards the Galapagos. The geologist in him was all excited. He wrote home and said, I'm going to see my first volcanoes. He wanted to see lava spewing volcanoes. And when he arrived in the Galapagos, this is what he saw. He saw giant tortoises. He referred to them in his diary as antediluvian-looking creatures. He saw ocean-going lizards. I mean, who had heard of such a thing? The sailors, the sailors of the Beagle called them imps of darkness. And they also saw some humdrum-looking birds like this mockingbird. Now, you might think, oh, this is a naturalist paradise, not to Darwin at all. He said he called it a reptile paradise. But immediately in his diary, he noted that the Galapagos, they smelled funny. And it was unbearably hot. And he actually explicitly referred to the place of this is what hell must be like. So he collected on several islands for about five weeks, but he was very eager to leave the Galapagos. Um, he collected a, a variety of things, including these mockingbirds, which he found slightly different forms on a few different islands. And he didn't realize their significance until a few months later, but he was sort of preoccupied with getting off these islands and getting to the next set which included Tahiti, which turned out to have very calm waters and coral reefs and was kind of a respite from the ordeal of a lot of the other sailing he had done on the Beagle. So the Beagle kept sailing west to Australia, to South Africa, and finally now, in the fifth year of the voyage, all the Beagle has to do is turn up north from the African coast and he'd be on his way home. But not with the incredibly and most obsessive captain in the British Navy, Captain Fitzroy of the Beagle decided he wanted to recheck some measurements of the things they had done in South America, so he sailed across the Atlantic again. <laughs> and Darwin wrote home and said, I loathe, I abhor the sea and all ships which sail on it. <laughs> but there he was. He, he, he was going to be stuck on board for a much longer time, and he resolved to, he had to spend his time productively. So his strategy was, with all of these collections, all of these notes that he had taken over the course of these five years, that he was going to rely on experts in England to determine the significance of what he had found, the plants, the animals, the fossils, the rock specimens. But they couldn't work from his rough notebooks. They were just too sketchy, often scrawled while he was kind of shaking back and forth in his hammock, slung above a table. That was his bed for five years. So he starts transcribing his notes in a more orderly way, and he starts working on his birds. And in this ornithology notebook, which an actual page of which is illustrated here, he starts going over the birds of the Galapagos. And on that last couple of months home, he has his first eureka moment. He starts by describing that when I see these islands, the Galapagos Islands, in sight of each other and possessed of but a scanty stock of animals, tentated by these birds, but slightly differing in structure and filling the same place in nature, I must suspect they are only varieties. And I'm thinking about these mockingbirds. He says, you know, if there's the slightest foundation for these remarks, the zoology of archipelagos will be well worth examining, for such facts would undermine the stability of species. Undermine the stability of species. Species might change. He's gripped with this idea. This isn't what he was taught at Cambridge. This isn't what anyone taught him in England. This is, in fact, heresy. Species might change. He arrives home, and he enters a phase he describes as mental rioting, gripped with this idea of how species might change and thinking back over everything he's seen on the voyage and what it might mean in terms of the origin of species. He keeps these little pocket notebooks that in stream of consciousness fashion, he just jots down the notes that run through his mind all day long. Some don't have anything to do with biology, but nonetheless, we still have these notebooks, so we know what he was thinking about. Let me just show you a few entries from one particular notebook. So in 1837, he jots down on one page, we may look at Megatherium, which is another extinct ground sloth, and armadillos and sloths as all offsprings of some still older type. What is he thinking? He's thinking, well, I've, I see living animals today, and I see extinct animals. There must be even still older things that these are the offspring of. He's thinking about the succession of life through time. 
fact, I think organized beings, they, they represent a tree, like a family tree, irregularly branched, such that some branches are far more branched with more species. There's many terminal buds dying, going extinct as new ones generated. A little later on, he thinks about the kinds of animals he saw on each continent. He thinks, you know, I, I saw sloths and fossil sloths in South America, but he didn't see sloths in Australia or in Africa. There are different animals there. So I think the similarity of animals in one country, that must be due to their springing from one branch. And on the very next page, he writes a little diagram. The most famous diagram in all of natural history because it's an entirely new system of natural history that describes species as the offspring of previous species. As natural as children are the offspring of their parents and parents of grandparents, etc. But species arise completely naturally. There's a family tree of life. This is the end of special creation for Darwin. The ruling doctrine of his time. He's not going to tell anybody. He's 28 years old. He's barely getting his feet on the ground in England. He's being invited to the highest scientific circles. He's being applauded for all of his collections on the Beagle. Disclosing this heresy would be the end of all that. And much worse, he had very tender feelings for his professors who had made the voyage possible and who had kept up his courage and his spirits by correspondence throughout the voyage. This would be like spitting in their face. So he kept it to himself, kept working on this idea, and the next year he comes up with the idea of natural selection, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But a couple years of this mental rioting, you can also see in his notes, he's feeling a little bit exasperated. Because here he is, you know, he's been trained by some of the best minds, he's reading the most influential scientists, and he's thinking, you know, astronomers have now told us, you know, the place of the Earth in the solar system, and geologists have now told us that you know, the landforms are the product of completely natural processes. You know, why does life have to be special? And he's feeling a bit exasperated, which I think is reflected in this quote. Here's one of these notebooks again, They're a real page from the notebook, and here's a transcript. He says, we can allow satellites, planets, suns, universes, nay, whole systems of universes to be governed by laws, but the smallest insect we wish to be created at once by special act. All right, now here's somebody who collected a whole lot of small insects. And at every little beetle he thought, no, that's, that doesn't make any sense. If the heavens can be ruled by natural laws, why not life? Why not life? But all these thoughts are private. He has a golden opportunity to spill the beans because while he's writing all of these private thoughts in his notebooks, he's writing the public account of the voyage of the beetle. His contribution to this volume, which you have, if you stumble across it in some used bookshop, you might want to snap it up. It's worth about $100,000. <laughs> so he's going to describe in the course, and it's a fascinating read, his, his part of this book is what we now refer to as Voyage of the Beagle, a standalone book that many of us have seen. He's describing the places they went, the people that he saw, the creatures that he saw, the earthquakes and glaciers and all sorts of fantastic natural phenomena. So eventually, he's going to have to describe what he saw in the Galapagos. He knows species change. What's he going to say? He's going to dodge it. And here's the dodge. He says, it's clear that if several islands have each their peculiar species of the same genera, when these are placed together, they'll have a wide range of character. Think of those finches with all their different kinds of beaks. <clears throat> but there's not space in this work to enter on this curious subject. That's it. That's all you get. There's different species of birds on these islands in the Galapagos, but no space to talk about them. When Alfred Wallace later reads these words in the 1840s, he feels the question of the origin of species has been left wide open by the great Darwin. Now, Darwin keeps working on this idea. In 1842, he sits down and writes a 35-page sketch of his theory of the origin of species. In 1844, he extends that to 230 pages, complete with a table of contents. And many of the headers in that table of contents look hauntingly familiar with respect to a book that's still not going to appear for 15 more years. And he says, he's now married, he says to his wife, 
well, should I die? And he was kind of a hypochondriac. Thought he could die at any minute. Um, he said, should I die? You know, please see to it that it's published. But he didn't think it was worth anyone seeing while he was alive. So Wallace was privy to none of this. Had Darwin disclosed what he was thinking in 1839 or in 1842 or in 1844, you know, Wallace might not have gone to the Amazon. He might not be in that open lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic. But Darwin didn't say what he was thinking, so there was Wallace. Now, of course, if Wallace hadn't been rescued, we would never heard of Wallace ever. So he was rescued, and here's his short account. Ten days and ten nights passed when a vessel was seen, and by night we were on board her, much rejoiced to have escaped a death on the wide ocean, whence none would have ever come to tell the tale. Okay, where am I getting these little quotes from Wallace? I'm getting them from one of the most fascinating documents I've ever read. It's a letter that Wallace wrote on board the rescue ship to a friend back in Brazil where he recounts his whole ordeal beginning with the decision to turn around in the jungle and the animals he was taking care of and finding a ship home and the ship catching fire and the days in the lifeboat and finally being rescued and he writes this in sections in the long voyage home on the rescue ship and yet I think those are water splotches that are on the letter and amazingly his friend in Brazil saved this letter and it's in the Natural History Museum in London as I said, he wrote this in sections. So as you read on in this letter a little bit after he describes his rescue, he tells his friend, 50 times since I left Para, the coast of Brazil, have I vowed if I once reached England, never to trust myself on the ocean again. A few days later, but good resolutions soon fade. So despite his loss, despite his near-death experience, he had nothing to show for his four years in the Amazon. He was not satisfied. He decides that as soon as he can regain his health, kind of put his affairs in order, he's going to go back out. Spirit and deed. And of course, it's Wallace who's going to flush Darwin out into the open. So Wallace's first issue to decide is, where am I going to go? And he thinks, well, um, I'm not going to go to the Amazon. Maybe he just thought it was bad luck. But I'm not going to go to the Amazon. Bates, who's still there, Bates has that covered as a one person can cover the Amazon. So he wants to go somewhere new, somewhere where the collecting would be good because he has the same problem. He's going to have to pay his way by collecting extra specimens. And he's done some reading about the Malay archipelago and he thinks, this looks promising. So off he heads. In April of 1854, he lands in Singapore. And now over the course of the next eight, eight years, He's going to hop from island to island across this chain. And he's going to trust himself on the ocean. He's going to make 96 crossings, totaling 14,000 miles. He's going to collect over 120,000 specimens that this time will be secure. So he arrives in Singapore. What does he have to do? He's got to collect, not just for himself, but other things that people want. He's got to go treasure hunting. So what's he looking for? Things like this. Magnificent bird wing butterflies, named for their giant wingspan and coveted for those incredibly colorful wing patterns. So finding these things is, of course, the concern of a paid collector. But Wallace is also noticing where he finds them. And if I show you a few butterflies that we still have that Wallace collected in his own personal collection, these are some different butterflies bird wing butterflies from the Malay Archipelago. And you'll notice that, yeah, they are all, there's some resemblance there. But there's some different forms here, some different species. And they're from different islands. And these butterflies signal to Wallace just what the birds of the Galapagos signal to Darwin. You have slightly different species on adjacent islands. Species change. But Wallace has none of the inhibitions that Darwin has. He has nothing to lose. He's thousands of miles away in England. He's an amateur. So as soon as these thoughts enter his head, he starts jotting reports off to natural history magazines, even scientific journals. And in his very first year in the Malay Archipelago, he writes this scientific paper, which I have to confess I didn't know much about until two or three years ago. Look at the title. 
on the law which has regulated the introduction of new species. I think he's being rather direct about this. What's he say here? Well, he's thinking about birdwing butterflies and among some other things that he's seeing. And he's contrasting his experience in the Amazon with the Malay Archipelago. He's thinking, you know, I see birdwing butterflies in the Malay Archipelago. I didn't see those in the Amazon. I saw different kinds of butterflies in the Amazon. So he's thinking about the geographic distribution of animals on the planet now that he has this chance of all this whole new set of jungles to study. And he says, you know, I see that the most closely allied species, they're found in geographical proximity. So his law, which he calls the Sarawak law, because it's conceived on the island of Sarawak, he says, I think every species has come into existence coincident both in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. Species from species. Oh, and he adds this little gem. You know, I think the best mode of representing the natural arrangement of species is a branching tree. So what was the reaction to this paper? The dates start to become important. This is 1855. The reaction is, Wallace, stop your theorizing. Send us more bird wings. So he was ignored. Okay, well, he's got to keep collecting. So he's got to make his way now further west and realize these islands aren't too well known, certainly not to Europeans. So he needs local help. So he calls upon local experts, like, for example, the Dayak tribe of Borneo. Now, this tribe had a fierce reputation, but Wallace found them quite helpful. They also had their own sort of natural history collecting hobby. Rather quaint. Um, and fortunately, none of these skulls are Wallace's or else. Okay. Um, we never would have seen them. So he gets his help, and he starts finding more treasure as he works his way from west to east. And one day, he has to sort of improvise his travel. One day, he's making a really short crossing between two islands. He thought it wouldn't amount to much. Between Bali and Lombok. And not just on Lombok, but as he worked his way further east, he realized a really dramatic change in the types of animals that he encountered. He noticed that whereas on Sumatra, he saw things like tigers, and on Java, he saw a rhinoceros, and on Borneo, he saw monkeys and orangutans, when he worked his way east, like in New Guinea and the Aru Islands, he saw tree kangaroos and cuscus, marsupials. Now, what's up with this? Now, think of what a tree kangaroo is. You know, everyone knows when you think kangaroo, you think hop, hop, hop across Australia, right? What is a kangaroo doing in the jungle, in the canopy? And as Wallace thinks this over, he thinks, this is really strange. You know, the jungles of Borneo look just like the jungles of New Guinea. Why would there be monkeys in one jungle and kangaroos in the other? He says it's almost as though there's a line separating the western and eastern islands where animals on the west side of this line are typical of Asia and animals on the east side are typical of Australia. In fact, we still refer to this line as the Wallace line, something that he discovered. And as he mulls this, mulls this over, he says, what could this explain this distribution of animals? It doesn't make sense, certainly not with the model of special creation. If animals are created to fit the habitat that they're best suited for, well, why would you put a kangaroo up in the canopy? The very same habitat that monkeys live in, not so far away. He says, no, there must be a historical explanation for this distribution. His Sarawak law that species come into existence with closely allied pre-existing species. And Wallace, who's up on the geology of the day, is thinking, you know, I think Australia and the Aru Islands and New Guinea, they all were connected to each other once, but not to Asia. And so the animals of these islands, all marsupials, have adapted to the different conditions on these islands. And that's why you find marsupials over here, placental mammals over here. Species change. He's certain of it now. Now he just wants to know how. So he keeps working his way east, and he heads for this little island called Ternati, right up here under the word fauna. And one day, February 1858, he's wrapped in a blanket, shaking with a malarial fever. It's 88 degrees outside. And the answer of how species change occurs to him. And as soon as the fever starts to abate a bit, he writes it down almost in stream of consciousness fashion, consciousness fashion like Darwin. And here's what he has to say. Remember, this is someone who's now spent eight years in the jungle. 
He says, I see the life of wild animals as a struggle for existence and to provide for the infant offspring. Perhaps all the variations, and he's seen a lot of variations, he's collected a lot of specimens of individual species. They're all a little bit different from each other. Perhaps all these variations must have some definite effect, however slight, in the habits or capacities of the individuals. A variety having slightly increased powers must inevitably in time acquire superiority in numbers. And he called this idea on the tendency of species to depart indefinitely from the original type. Oh, okay, he, no degree in marketing there, Wallace, you know. And he thought, well, you know, I've, I've kind of thought this up in a fever. I don't want to publish this without vetting it with another naturalist. So he sent this letter to a naturalist with whom he'd begun a correspondence the year earlier. He sent it to Charles Darwin. Who was shocked. Shocked when he read it. He immediately told his closest friends, Wallace could not have come up with a better abstract of my theory than if he had had all my writing in front of him. But of course, Wallace had no idea what Darwin was working on. No clue at all. So let me show you why in detail Darwin would have been shocked. I want to show you unpublished writings from Darwin, what he was working on in 1857 as he was sketching out his big species theory in his home at Down where he did all the work of his later 40 years of his life he started a chapter in February called The Struggle for Existence as bearing on natural selection and he explains a bit on after this passage all nature is at war the struggle very often falls on the egg and seed or on the seedling any variation however infinitely slight if it did promote during any part of life, even in the slightest degree, the welfare of the being, such variation would tend to be preserved or selected. I've highlighted, of course, the similar terms. How could these two men, who had no idea of each other, no idea what each was thinking, no access to each other's writing, how could they come up with such similar ideas? Think about it. They had both gone out and seen the world. They'd seen nature in the raw. They'd seen that nature is a battlefield. They'd seen slightly different species on adjacent islands. They had both read the same social economist, Thomas Malthus, who said that you know, the check on human populations is war and famine and disease and death and realized that would apply a hundredfold in nature. Great minds think alike. They had essentially a very similar fact pattern very similar input, came up with very similar language and a very similar idea. So what's to be done? Well, Darwin turns this matter over to his two closest confidants, as actually Wallace asked one of them to, to see to it that the paper was published. And Darwin himself is distracted. Scarlet fever has struck the village of Down, and Charles Jr., his tenth child, is ill. And his two confidants, confidants decide that the best thing to do is to... Uh, publish Wallace's letter and an abstract of Darwin's work. And so, a little bit later, July 1st, this is what's done in front of the Linnaean Society in London. Wallace isn't there. He's thousands of miles away. Darwin isn't there. That very same day, he's burying Charles Jr., who died of scarlet fever. So this is the public debut of the theory of evolution by natural selection and no one paid any attention whatsoever. Quite famously, the head of this society later in the year, kind of writing his annual report, said you know, nothing of tremendous significance happened this year. But of course, Darwin was now alerted to the fact that others were having similar thoughts, and that gave him the impetus to finish his great book. And the next year, this book appeared the book whose anniversary we're going to be celebrating, 150th anniversary we're going to be celebrating next month. And when this book appeared, everybody paid attention. Why? Well, perhaps more than anything, he wrote it so that lay people could understand it. And he also wrote very persuasively. He argued both sides of any idea. He marshaled evidence from a broad swath of science. Many of us think that the prose is extremely good and and poetic in some places. So everybody paid attention. And of course, scientists paid attention. And what they thought was 
you know, this is perhaps setting the agenda when it has for the next 150 years. And the first question that came to mind was this idea of natural selection. Could it really explain the diversity we see in the world? Could it explain the fine differences among species? Is it, is it strong and sensitive enough? Well, the timing of this book was pretty good. Because remember our old friend Henry Walter Bates that we left behind in the Amazon? Well, this very same year, 1859, Bates dragged his rather beaten and emaciated body home from the Amazon. After 11 years, 10 of those collecting on his own, he collected not 14,000 specimens, he collected 14,700 different species, 8,000 of which were new to science. And when Bates started to organize his collection, he arrived in the summer, actually, and the book appeared in the fall. As the book appeared, he realized that Darwin had given him a framework for everything he had seen in the jungle. But he had seen some things Darwin hadn't thought about. He had some gems for the great naturalists. And he writes a letter to Darwin, and he says, I think I've got a glimpse into the laboratory where nature manufactures her new species. Oh, this is music to Darwin's ears. He's taking a pounding in the popular press over the origin of species. Now, here's a naturalist with 11 years experience telling him, I've got something for you, Mr. Darwin. Well, what did he have? Darwin's saying, come on, Bates, <laughs> tell me what you've got. He says, well, you know, I, what I noticed was I often found completely harmless creatures in, in particular areas resembled nasty, noxious, or poisonous ones in the same vicinity. Like this beetle that had sort of the same color scheme as this wasp. Or this caterpillar that, when I collected specimens like this, with its, where its one head at one end of the animal looked like the head of a small pit viper, I carried it into the villages. Everyone ran off frightened. Now, why would this be? Why would perfectly harmless creatures resemble nasty, noxious, or poisonous ones? Well, of all the creatures that Bates studied in the Amazon, none meant more to him than the butterflies. And boy, did he find a lot of butterflies. In one area alone, he captured 550 species. That's more than double the number of butterflies in all of Europe. What did he notice about these butterflies? Well, if you take a glance at these, you might think that in the right-hand column, these two butterflies would be related. In the left-hand column, those two butterflies would be related. But you'd be wrong. It's the top two butterflies that are close relatives that belong to the same family, and the bottom two butterflies that are close relatives that belong to the same but different family. What is going on? Well, what Bates noticed was that when he handled these lower butterflies, they gave off kind of a noxious substance in his hand. And when he left them drying on a specimen table, birds didn't come by and grab them like they grabbed other butterflies. And the lizards didn't run off with them. And when they flew through the jungle, birds didn't chase them like they chased other butterflies. And he realized, when he saw these other butterflies living in the same district, that they wouldn't be chased or eaten either despite the fact they were completely harmless. So he realized that these butterflies by ga were gaining an advantage by mimicking, in their appearance, other butterflies, nasty butterflies, distasteful butterflies to birds. But he noticed that all the members of the upper species weren't identical. It's not like they were toys stamped out by a press. They were slightly different from each other. They were variable. And he thought that variation meant this is a natural process that makes these butterflies slightly different. What would be that natural process? Natural selection. So he wrote, to exist at all in a given locality are leptalis, which is the name of these upper butterflies. She must wear a certain dress, and those of its varieties that do not come up to the mark are rigidly sacrificed. I believe the case offers a most beautiful proof of the theory of natural selection. Butterflies that aren't a good match get eaten. Butterflies that are a good match are preserved, naturally selected. So who else do you think thought this was a great proof of natural selection? Darwin sees the paper, writes Bates a very warm letter. This is the actual text of the letter. And in the middle of it, he says, in my opinion, it's one of the most remarkable and admirable papers I ever read in my life. And Darwin wanted to make sure nobody missed the message from Bates' work. He wrote several accounts of it in one account. He said, this is as close as we're going to get on this planet to witnessing the birth of a new species. Evolving butterflies, matching harmful or distasteful butterflies in the same district. So this is 1862, and finally that very year, Wallace comes home from the Malay Archipelago. 
Now think of the th relationships that now exist between these three men. Ever since Wallace's letter, Darwin and Wallace have now kept up a very lively correspondence in, for five years. Well, Darwin is Bates's biggest supporter, for which Bates is eternally grateful. And Bates, of course, is corresponding with Darwin all the time. And Bates and Wallace, well, they went to the Amazon together in the 1840s. They've been friends for nearly 20 years. And all the while that Wallace is in the Malay Archipelago, he's sending letters to Bates. And when Bates is in the Amazon, he's sending letters to Wallace. So these three men have great mutual admiration for each other, a close bond, and they are great friends for the rest of their lives. You usually see them portrayed like this, you know, in their iconic phase. And it's really these three men who then promote the theory of evolution by natural selection for the rest of their lives. And their voyages and their works and their discoveries constitute this golden age of evolutionary science where our view of nature changed completely. Now, the last thing I'd want to do is to imply that the good days were over, far from it. Certainly over the next 150 years, there were great explorations and expeditions, particularly in filling in the fossil record. And if you want to read about those, well, I know a good book. Um, but moreover, I submit that we are right now in a second golden age of evolutionary science. It's one where, from the laboratory, we can now see how new species are made. Now, modern biologists, we're sort of, well, we're collectors too. And we're trying to put together menageries, much like the one that Wallace tried to bring home from the Amazon. We've got sloths and armadillos and platypus and wallabies and even chimpanzees. But we're not taking them to zoos. We're not stuffing them and putting them in a museum. We're looking at their DNA. We're looking at their DNA in detail to reconstruct the record of evolution, a whole new record of evolution, one in which we can pinpoint the exact changes that have taken place between species that are responsible for their adaptation to the different parts of the planet, where we can pinpoint the changes that are responsible for the different appearances of animals. And we've got 52 mammals so far. That number's going up, and it's going to go up dramatically quite soon. About 2,000 species altogether. And we're mining this massive record for insights into the process of evolution. And I have to say, as one of these modern-day indoor biologists, that we share the same sense of wonder and surprise and discovery as the pioneers I've told you about. You know, only we don't have to barf our way to work as Darwin did, or cope with malaria, or headhunters, just peer review. It's another form of cannibalism. Um, and we no longer stare at the creatures like this butterfly as Bates did, just memorized, mesmerized by its external beauty because we now can see the genes in action that are responsible for making animal forms and for the diversity of animal forms. And what could be better than fossils, like these actual fossils or sketches of fossils that Darwin collected himself in South America? How about DNA from fossils? A whole new record of the past that not only Darwin couldn't have thought of, but really most biologists didn't think was going to be possible until very recently. Those tales, they're, they're for another day. My goal here today was to highlight where this all started. And among the past adventurers, the one we celebrate this year and above all is Darwin. So why? Well, I'm going to let Wallace have the last word on that. I want to show you, I think, a really special letter. There's been a lot of speculation over the last 150 years. You know, how did Wallace feel about this arrangement where he came up with this great idea, but it was published alongside Darwin? You know, was that fair? He wasn't consulted. He was thousands of miles away. They didn't ask him whether that was okay. Well, after the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin sent a copy to Wallace while he was still in the Malay Archipelago. And we have that copy with all of Wallace's margin notes in it. And once he finished reading this, as he said five times over, he sent a letter to his old friend, Henry Walter Bates, a letter that I submit 
that some, he didn't expect some goofball from Wisconsin to be reading to you 150 years later, okay? But on Christmas Eve in 1860, he was now back on the island of Ternate. He often crisscrossed and doubled back on the same islands. He sat down to write his, his old friend. And he's going to give him his reactions to the origin of species. Here's what Wallace has to say. He says, I know not how or to whom to express fully my admiration for Darwin's book. It's overwhelming argument and it's admirable tone and spirit. Mr. Darwin has created a new science and a new philosophy, and I believe that never has such a complete illustration of a new branch of human knowledge been due to the labors and researches of a single man. That's how Wallace felt. I think this is perhaps the most gracious letter in the history of science. But he wrote many others like this. This was clearly his feelings. He lived for another 50 years. He outlived Darwin by 30 years. He always referred to this idea as Darwinism. He was really just happy to be included in the conversation. So, and of course, Darwin produced much more than on the origin of species. He produced the descent of man, the idea of sexual selection, uh, tomes on our understanding of the domestication of animals and plants, books on the biology of orchids, earthworms, the first correct theory of coral reef formation. So no doubt our greatest naturalist, and that's why we celebrate. So on Darwin's 200th birthday and the anniversary of the publication of this great book, I want to offer a couple of, well, birthday wishes and closing thoughts for you to ponder. And my first is really, and why I've told you these stories this way, is that more people will appreciate the great spirit that drove Charles and Alfred and Henry and many other young men and women to risk their health, to risk their lives, Explore the unknown, to just follow their dreams and to uncover what they could of the history of life. 